say, some days, that's not the first thought on my mind. I need to work. I want to talk a little bit this evening about um, how many of you ever been ever been caught in the act? Doing something, you know you was wrong. You knew you was wrong when you did it. But you thought you could get away with it. But right midstream, you get busted dead to rights. Anybody ever experienced that? When you're like I was and you do enough stuff, the laws of averages aren't in your favor. You're going to get busted, right? Uh, we're going to look at a few verses in the 6th chapter of Galatians. While you're, while you're looking, I want to share something with you. Uh, somebody, I think it was Sean, brought up. The, we, had a, we had a new family here this morning. They weren't new here, but I hadn't seen them here on a Sunday morning, but I've seen them here the last two Wednesday nights. And um, that, that's exciting. That's, that's growth. That's exciting. And that's, um, you know, Jean Ann talked to us about this, this new ministry that, that God put on her for us as a church to take on. And um, both of the weeks that we've had it, that family has not only come to the Roots thing downstairs and had dinner and and, but they came up and stayed for Bible study. And then this morning, that family was here for, for church. So, so I ask you to continue to support that. But don't just show up. Show up expecting. Show up expecting. That's growth. That, that's our job, isn't it? And on that same note, this coming Sunday, if all goes well, we have one person that would like to take membership at Claypool United Methodist Church. So, uh, be in prayer about that. Maybe we can get two out of it. We'll see. We'll see. We'll work it this week, okay? So Galatians uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, says, My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become their cause for pride. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to be here in your house this evening, Lord. We thank you for, for all the blessings that you give us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the, for the wonderful service that you, you gave us this morning, Lord. And Lord, we're looking forward to this evening as well, Lord. Lord, we just pray that your spirit fall on this place, Lord, and that, that, that we accept your Holy Spirit, Lord, and that we're obedient to your Spirit. Lord, and once again, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be found pleasing in your sight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to tell you a story about little Johnny. Now, I don't know, I didn't think about this when we were getting ready to have a son. Why would, why would you name your son John or Johnny? Every story you ever had about somebody doing something wrong, it was always little Johnny, wasn't it? So, but anyway, little Johnny was standing there with cake in his hands and a, a trail of crumbs all across the floor and chocolate icing smeared all over his face. There was no doubt, no denying it, no blaming somebody else. Johnny'd been busted. Johnny was old enough to know better but Johnny had been told, don't touch that cake. That cake's for dinner. Now for the next few minutes, instead of let's all badmouth little Johnny because nobody gets cake for dinner now, I want you to put yourself in Johnny's shoes. 
Think about that. What do, you, what do you think would happen next? What would happen at your house if you were little Johnny? If mommy set a cake out there and said, don't touch that cake, that's for dinner. And she comes in, the cake's all destroyed, crumbs everywhere, and you've got chocolate icing from ear to ear. What's going to happen? <laughs> so you think little Johnny's going to get yelled at? Not by mommy? Think he'd be sent to time out or, or had to go to bed with, without supper? Or, or the worst thing that every little kid dreads the most? Wait till your dad gets home. We want to talk about when somebody is caught in the act, all right? Little Johnny was caught in the act, wasn't he? And for the sake of argument, some of you may not understand little Johnny's temptation because statistically about 4% of the earth's population does not like chocolate, okay? So if you're in that 4%, you don't understand what little Johnny was facing there. But you do understand that when something's placed in front of you and you're told under no circumstances are you to even touch that, what happens? Bells start going off and things start lighting up and whistles start blowing and lights are flashing and your taste buds start, you start uh, uh, watering at the mouth and, and a little demon pops up on one shoulder and a little angel on the other shoulder, right? And we find ourselves right in the middle of a battle. We know what's right and we know what we want in that moment. Just a few verses uh, back in, in chapter 5 of Galatians, it says the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. How many of you all know all too well about that? Temptation's not a once in a while thing, is it? Temptation's not something, well, I put that behind me. I'm done with that, right? We have to deal with temptation day in and day out. And sometimes we live in constant fight of, of opposing natures. But the good news is we don't have to face temptation alone, do we? Who is it that's going to help us with our temptation? We sang about him a while ago. Whatever you need, what is he? Right. God will help us resist temptation. We can learn to recognize people and situations that are more likely to lead us into temptations. One of the best ways to overcome temptation is to run from it. Don't walk into a situation that you know is going to be full of temptation. Pray for God's guidance and help with it. And seek others to help support and encourage you, godly friends and, and, and people in church. How many of you know people that, that have overcome some, some great odds, but the way they did it was they had to get away from their old life, completely remove themselves from the situation. And sometimes that's what we have to do. Doesn't the Bible tell us that? If the left hand calls you to sin, what are you supposed to do? Cut it off. So when Johnny is standing right in front of you with chocolate cake from ear to ear, what do you do to help restore that person gently, as we're told in Scripture? How are you to humbly help that person back onto the right path? Is that our job as Christians? We're supposed to go out into the world. That's our mission field, isn't it? So as Christians, we can learn how to take action, how to react, when somebody is caught red-handed and how to respond to things in the Holy Spirit. So what are we taught to do when somebody is caught in sin? Our scripture says, If anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. But be careful. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. That happens sometimes, doesn't it? We think we're helping somebody else out, but instead of pulling them out of the ditch, what happens? We get drugged down in the ditch too. 
It's like a story about four ladies of influence in the community met for a friendly lunch one day, and, and during their conversation, one lady said, we need to pour our hearts out. We need to admit certain sins and needs because confession's good for the soul. So the first lady confessed that, well, I hate to admit it, but I just really like to read them romance novels. And, and the racier and steamier they are, the better I like them. And the second lady said, well, when I balanced a checkbook, I always had a few dollars and then I'd tell my husband, I'm going to go visit my cousin, but instead I'd go off on a shopping trip. And the third lady said, well, I just can't shake a gambling habit. I, I recently lost so much money that I had to take a part-time job to pay it back so my husband won't find out. And when the fourth lady's turn came to confess, she, she wouldn't say anything. Nope, I, I got nothing to say. And the others kept pushing her and kept pushing her and kept pushing her and said, come on, we, we confessed our sins and admitted our faults. What is your big secret? It can't be any worse than what we've already admitted. Finally, she said, well, my biggest weakness is gossiping and I can't wait to get out of here. You want to know why a lot of people don't come to church? People right here in this community, why they don't come to church? Because they've made mistakes. And they know that you know about it. How many of you ever said, you know, I, I went to school with that person, or I used to run around with that person? In a close-knit community, you know everybody, don't you? There's no secrets, is there? The devil, try, he will not try to tell you, you can keep this hidden, but there's no secrets, is there? And the temptation for us is to make misery out of mistakes. But God wants us to make fruit out of faults instead, doesn't he? When somebody comes to us or we, we hear something about somebody, we're supposed to hold that in a, in a sacred trust. Because the last thing little Johnny wants to hear when he walks into church on Sunday morning is for people to start whispering and pointing. Say, so, yeah, there's that little Johnny. He got caught this week, had chocolate all over his face. One of the first mistakes that we can make as Christians is to be complacent and self-righteous and start thinking it's okay to whisper and judge and condemn other people. Well, not a one of us. No Christian should ever think they're self above temptation. Most of us would go for that chocolate cake, wouldn't we? You get just a little bit off the corner of that ice and you'll never know the difference, right? We've all made mistakes, haven't we? Not a one of us here is, is without sin. Not a one of us here hasn't done something wrong. But no mistake is too much for the mercy of God. Because no matter how many times you mess up, guess what? God still has a plan, doesn't he? And that plan still includes you. But to get your life back and get your strength back, you have to get out of the negative, condemned, and, and hypocritical mindset. Because all that does is keep you from the new things that God wants to do. See, it's important for us to learn to receive God's forgiveness, isn't it? Some people struggle with that. Some people, maybe it comes easy. But some people struggle with that. Some people struggle with receiving forgiveness because they can't understand how God can forgive me when I can't forgive myself. We have to learn to receive God's forgiveness and how to be restored by His mercy second verse in our scripture says for us to bear one another's burden and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ we have a duty to help each other don't we we have a duty to lift one another up 
You don't bring everybody into one room and then start pointing fingers and, and condemning somebody in front of a crowd. Because what's that do? That destroys the person. The body of Christ, that's what the church is, right? We're the body of Christ. Functions when the members work together. What is the law of Christ that, that's referred to here? What, what did Jesus say was the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? And all your mind and all your strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the law of Christ, isn't it? So there you stand. Little Johnny, chocolate cake from ear to ear. What do you need to hear? What do you need to happen next? What do you think Jesus would say to little Johnny? I think the first thing he'd say is, Johnny, I love you. Now step away from the cake. <laughs> but he'd start with, Johnny, I love you. Because Jesus stands ready to forgive. But forgiveness begins with confession and repentance. That starts a change in your heart. you struggle with receiving Christ's forgiveness, God can help you with that. But first, you have to be willing to stop doing wrong. You have to be willing to accept change. When, then you need to hear somebody say, let me help you carry this plate. Let me help you carry that cake over to the counter and put it down. Because Johnny needs to know that somebody cares. Johnny needs to hear somebody say, let's talk about it. There are times when, when, when yelling and time out and sending a child to bed without supper or, or waiting until your father gets home, there, there's times that those are appropriate and there's times that those don't work because all those actions are punishment. We've been studying Genesis for, for several weeks now, haven't we? And what do you notice? People mess up every chapter, don't they? And what happens every chapter? How does their interaction with God start after they mess up? Repentance. And God saying, I love you. And showing that I love you. Now there might be some, some, some things happen because of what they did, but it always starts with, I love you. Either in word or in action, God always shows us that he loves us. And I, for one, am thankful for that, for somebody that's messed up as many times as I have, I'm thankful that God is a God of free will and allows us to make choices. Now, don't get me wrong. I know, and you know, that unrepentant sin cannot go unpunished forever without Jesus, can it? But God allows us to make choices. God allows us to make mistakes, but God also provided the cross. We didn't do that. God provided that, didn't he? And it's on the cross that Jesus takes our place for the mistakes I made. He takes my punishment. He takes on that sin, so instead of getting punished like we deserve, we get grace and mercy to go free. Paul wrote to the Romans, didn't he? There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. It didn't say there's no condemnation deserved for those. It says there is none, period. Jesus took it. Where's the phrase caught red-handed come from? It literally means being caught with blood on your hands. And each and every one of us, when we stand under the cross, we're caught red-handed. Each and every one of us has Jesus' blood on So many people in our world today struggle with the feelings of guilt from condemnation. But just like you and I learned the, the feelings of guilt from sin, you can learn the feeling of freedom through forgiveness. It's a learning process, isn't it? Don't just ask God for forgiveness. 
take it a step further and say to God, I'm asking for healing and I'm asking for restoration. Because then what you're saying is, God, I believe not only that you've forgiven me, but that you're going to restore me. That's an important step in it, isn't it? With confession and repentance and forgiveness, I believe that God begins to restore us and everything that the devil has taken away from us. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today, I declare that I will restore you double. It's from Zechariah. That's what God promised us when he begins the process to restore us. He doesn't forgive us and send us back to our old life, does he? Now sometimes he forgives us and we run right back to our old life, but God doesn't send us back to our old life. He does even better, doesn't he? He gives us a better life, one that we never even thought possible. Because when God restores us, we come back stronger, don't we? When God restores us, he makes us stronger and more powerful and better and improved even better than our original condition. And then in verse 3 and 4, for if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. Do we test ourselves? Do you ask yourself, you know, would I ask for help? If I was in that person's shoes, would I ask for help? Would I be too proud to repent? I listened to a, a, a powerful testimony this morning, about 4.30 this morning, actually. I was awake, and I read over the Sunday school lesson, and then uh, I, I, I watched a, a video of, some of y'all may know, Jason Hawkins. And he was at a church up in Fairmont, and he was sharing his testimony up there. And I don't know if any of y'all watched it. There were two parts of it. Uh, Jason is always down at the street ministry with one voice every Monday. And uh, for those of y'all that know Jason, Jason, Jason had about 20 years that, that he struggled with addiction. Raised in a, raised in a Christian home. Father was a, father was a preacher. And he told the story about being saved. He went to church, and he was going to church to, to basically say goodbye to his family because he'd already made up his mind that the life he was living wasn't worth living, so he might as well just end it. So he was going to go to church and, and, and tell his family that he loved them, and, and that was going to be it. And that particular night, his, his brother was, was preaching a, a sermon, and Jason was saved. And a little while after that, he had some medical issues, and he had been been prescribed some pain medication for those issues and he took one pill but because of the, the the years of abusing pain medication that one pill just wasn't cutting it he was still hurting so he took another he said next thing you know he had taken five of them but then he justified it because on the pill bottle it says take one pill every blah 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 and then it had as needed well he needed it so he went to church after taking five of these pain pills, and I don't remember which kind it was. And he knew he was wrong. When he got into church, he, he knew he was wrong. He knew he was abusing those prescription drugs. He knew he was going back to, and he was sitting almost, he said, in the same pew that he was sitting in the night he was saved. And his brother was up there preaching again. And they were talking about healing. He said, I heard God tell me. Go up there and let us pray for you. Nope, not going to do it. And this went back and forth a couple of times. He said, I'm not going up there and making a fool of myself again. But then he said, next thing he knew, he was up there. I don't know how I got there. But the point I'm trying to make is, will we be too proud to repent? 
well, I've been going to church here every Sunday, and these people think I'm a Christian, and what would they think if I walked up there and say, I Baba, I'm just not going to do it. How many of us would do that? How many of us would do that? Would I see my own faults? Yeah, I can see what everybody else does, right? Was that about people that live in glass houses? How many people do you know that believe the lies of the devil? People that go through life with no enthusiasm and no excitement and no hope. But see, God's looking for people that are willing to be restored. When those old thoughts come up and say, you don't deserve forgiveness, you know what you say to that? You're right. I don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. Because I don't get what I deserve. Don't be so focused on the mistake that you can't see the solution when the solution is right in front of your face. The Bible is a lot of things, isn't it? One of the things the Bible is, is a bunch of stories about people that made mistakes, isn't it? Every single one of them. Moses killed somebody, right? Sarah laughed at God. David had an affair. And then he wasn't done, was he? He killed to cover that affair up. Peter stood up. And he had a backbone about that wide, didn't he? I'll never deny you, Peter. If everybody else does it, I'll be right there with you. But he denied him three times. God never gave up on a single one of them, did he? Not one. And he won't give up on us either. Test your own actions. What would you want? How would you want to be treated? Would you give yourself another chance? Or would you simply say, I blew it. I had my chance and I failed. How many of us have started things that we didn't finish? can't do anything about the past, can we? So why do we want to continue to live in it? 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for the same mistakes that you made last week. Jesus knew that you were going to see that cake. And he knew that you weren't going to resist that cake. As a Christian, we need to ask for help, don't we? We need to ask God for help. What Hebrews 4.16 tell us, we're supposed to come boldly to the throne of grace. How many times has God had to clean your mess up? You made the mess. You made the bad choices. But when we ask, what happened? God gets his little, he's better than Mr. Clean, ain't he? He gets his little bucket and his mop and his sponge and whatever else is needed, and he comes and he cleans it all up, doesn't he? We may never know how God worked behind the scenes in our life to make something work out for good. How God caused the, just the right person to come along in our life and offer us something that, that only could have come from God. What would have been an even bigger mess turned out good because of God's mercy. There's no shame in making a mistake. We all do it. But you don't have to live in it. God's right there ready to come and straighten it all out. We just have to ask. How much has God already forgiven you of? He'll do it again, won't he? Who's wronged you that you need to forgive. Most of us were in Sunday school this morning. We talked about that, didn't we? We receive forgiveness how? It's in the Lord's Prayer. As we forgive others. 
who's wronged you that you need to forgive. Ask yourself, what does it feel like when you're the one that needs restored? If you have problems forgiving somebody, ask yourself that. What does it feel like when you're the one that needs restored? When you're the one that's messed up and you know it, you're feeling about that tall, you play racquetball on the side of a dime, all right? How's it feel? Today, you can leave here a clean person, wiped completely clean, whiter than snow, forgiven and restored, changed at the way you look at others because you've changed the way you understand the way God looks at you. Today, you can live your life by the Holy Spirit and restore people like Johnny who are covered with chocolate cake. That's our job as a church. Amen? To restore and to forgive them gently. Put ourselves in their situation. Walk a mile in their shoes. It's easy to sit back and say, I'd never do that, really. When each and every one of us have done that bad, if not worse. Not condemning, but sharing and carrying the burdens of one another in a Christ-like way. This is why I'm excited about revival. But you know, I was thinking also when we're up in the choir. We've got a board meeting after this. And some of the things we're going to talk about, it's awful that you have to talk about in church. Things like church security. Things like having to have Something that many of us probably thought would, something that would never come up in a church, would it? I mean, a church, you think the door should be open all the time and nothing's going to happen, right? There's a church, a United Methodist Church in the West Virginia Annual Conference that went to church this morning and their church was tore up because over the weekend somebody broke in and tore a bunch of stuff up. And I got to thinking about that. Well, I'm sitting right up here in the choir. And I was thinking, you know, in Jesus' time, we talk about how awful that is. I can't believe the world's got that bad. What were the first century church doing? They were hiding in basements and in rooms and, and worried that somebody was going to drag them out and take them to court and kill them and stone them and all kinds of things. So it's not any worse for us than it was for that church, was it? But see, that church was able to be the church and to build from that and to change the world. But how do we get back to here? We got back to here because the church forgot how to be the church. That's why I'm excited about revival. I'm not excited about what we can bring in. I'm excited about what we can send out. We can send out a whole church full of disciples for Jesus Christ because that's when the world gets changed. I'm excited. I want restored. I want revived. I want to be able to look at people and say, you know what? I see what Jesus sees in them. And sometimes it's a struggle, but I'm a work in progress, and I'm going to keep trying every single day. Because when I look at somebody, you know, my kids, I love them dearly, and I'm blessed. I'm blessed that I had kids that didn't act like their dad. All right? But if my kid was one of those that was out there struggling, I'd love my son. I'd love them dearly. And even though I know what they're doing is wrong, and I know they, they were raised better than that, I'd be more than a little upset if I knew other people were running them down and making their life even harder. See, God looks down on this world, and that's what he sees every day, doesn't he? He sees... One child over here that's struggling can't seem to find a way out of the mess that they've created as a life. And sees another child kicking them while they're down. The church needs to get out of that business and get back to being the church. Amen? Amen. Let's now stand.